Uh, hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, as Lashon Joya said, I'm the Sam Tresor TA Center Liaison to the state of Texas. Um, uh, the, the city of Austin and Travis County in particular have done amazing, amazing work with SOAR, and I'm really, really grateful to be able to partner with Lash Andrea and Kim from the um, S Ms. Ms. Kimberly Elder from the SSA office to be able to, you know, join these presentations and things like that uh, to help continue with the learning uh, for SOAR providers and really providers in general within this region. So uh, within my role, um, I'm here to just provide technical assistance related to SOAR. So any kind of questions that you have, no matter how big or how small, or if there are agencies on here that are like, that sounds very interesting. Um, I'd love for some of my providers to get trained in SORA. We'd like to have those services within our agency. I would be glad to chat about that. Thank you. Thank you. So hi everyone, good morning. I'm so happy to see everyone's smiling faces on here and so many people joining us. It's super exciting. Um, Lush Andrea has has done and continues to do such great work in formulating some awesome trainings based out of Austin and sharing with the rest of us here in Texas. So very, very much appreciated, Leshendrea. Um, so as Leshendrea was saying, my name is Lila Ordonez and I currently serve as program administrator for SOAR here at the agency I work for, Avenue 360 Health and Wellness. Um, and I also serve as the SOAR state uh, lead and so in my capacity as a uh, program administrator, I oversee a team of three. Um, so basically a SOAR navigator and two SOAR case managers. Um, we had, long story short, because y'all like to talk, um, <laughs> uh, we, we just uh, had back in September, um, SOAR finally got uh, some funds behind it here in Houston and super exciting. So three leading agencies, um, received the, the money um, and um, so it was Search Homeless Services, Avenue 360 and Healthcare for the Homeless. So super excited y'all. I haven't stopped bragging about that. I'm all over Texas. So um, and then um, so yeah, so that's as program administrator. And then as Texas lead, I serve as basically, um, you know, I do anywhere from refresher or assist with refresher trainings. Um, TA support, um, but TA support really comes from SOAR TA and I lean on Sumitra for that. Um, but community trainings, um, if an agency calls and says, hey, I've got a SOAR worker going and they're filling out their first application or they just have a couple of questions or I'm a program manager and I have a couple of questions about SOAR, then they call on me and I um, now that uh, COVID has really calmed down, I'm able to start going out to agencies again. So there's my, my role is pretty diverse and uh, I enjoy it very much. And again, I'm happy to see everyone on here and looking forward to this training and many more trainings. Wonderful. Thank you, Lila. Um, and, and one reason I asked for people to put um, the information in the chat, because <clears throat> even though we're going to go over other areas that you can receive benefits in. If anyone is interested in learning more about SOAR, then you can contact one of us. I'm in the Austin area, Austin Travis County area. Um, you can contact Lila or Sumitra um, because Lila is the state lead and Sumitra with SAMHSA. Well, thank you for that introduction. Let's see. All right, so we are going to get started and turn everything over to Kimberly Elder. Kimberly is with the Dallas Regional Public Affairs. Kimberly, thank you so much. We appreciate you for all the training that you have provided, and um, we would love for you to introduce yourself even more and go straight into the training. No thank problem. You. Thank, thank you guys for inviting me this morning. Uh, again, my name is Kimberly Elder. I bring you greetings from the Social Security Administration Public Affairs Office um, in downtown Dallas. Um, I have 20, almost 28, I almost said 28. I have 27 years of federal service with Social Security. 20 of those have been sent, uh, have been spent inside a Social Security field office as an SSI claims representative, uh, technical expert, as well as supervising all three of the programs. Um, today we're going to go over some different things that um, not uh, only will be able to assist your some of your clients that you service, but also uh, maybe you 
in the future moving forward. So um, I am pleased to actually be with you today. Now, normally for these presentations, uh, we ask that everyone mute, which of course it looks like everyone is, but we also ask that you also uh, turn your cameras off. Uh, as I'm going to uh, uh, complete the presentation as well. Uh, I'm going to share a couple of things uh, from my screen so that you can see the presentation. Uh, but again, my camera will be off as well, so I, you won't be distracted by me. And in case I start slobbering over here, you won't see me uh, wipe my mouth or anything like that. So we can we can keep it moving without a problem. So uh, again, thank you guys for having me today. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to do first and foremost is kind of Go ahead and share the PowerPoint. Hold on one second. My apologies, it didn't want to come up this morning. Uh, let's see, then we're going to start from the beginning. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes, we can um, see it. It's, excellent, it's, thanks it's guys. It's kind of small, yes. so it? we can see it. But it, it, it's good though. It's not taking up the full screen, but it looks good. I can see it. Okay, I have it on full screen. Okay, it's good. It's, okay, yes, excellent. It's good. Okay, so today we're going to discuss a little bit more in regards to some of the other Social Security programs that we have here at Social Security. And so in case you did not know, uh, approximately 178 million workers uh, will pay Social Security taxes in 2022, and about 94% of the entire workforce uh, are, are covered by Social Security taxes. And so uh, as we're moving through the era of Social Security and learning how Social Security helps us, um, I saw some of your beautiful faces, and I know that you're probably thinking none of this will, will probably uh, relate to me. Uh, but yes, it does. All of this has something to do with you if you are currently working and paying your Social Security taxes. Right now, our, our latest numbers in regards to uh, Social Security benefits uh, show that about 62 million people are receiving Social Security benefits. 62 million people receiving Social Security, which means they're either receiving retirement, uh, disability, or some type of survivor or auxiliary benefit from Social Security. You have a, a little over 5 million people who are receiving SSI benefits, and then you have a, a, over 2 million people who are receiving a combination of the two. Um, how an individual will receive a combination of, of both of those benefits, it depends on the amount of their monthly payment amount. And so because SSI is based on need, um, if their Social Security payment is less than $841, uh, plus 20, so $861 uh, a month, then they could possibly receive their Social Security as well as their SSI benefit. And so in regards to, to your Social Security taxes, um, in regards to FICA, some of you may see it on your pay stubs as uh, OASDI, that stands for Old Age Survivors and Disability Insurance, okay? Um, but let's let's break down what your Social Security taxes, how they actually work towards uh, getting a benefit for you. If you take a $100 bill and take $7.65 out of that $100 bill, we're going to break those the, that that amount down for you. So out of 700 uh, out of $7.65 you have six dollars and twenty cent of that seven sixty five that goes towards your social security payment. Six dollars and twenty cent out of every one hundred dollars that you earn goes towards your social security payment. The other one dollar and forty five cent goes towards your Medicare Part A coverage. And so, when you have someone who's applying for Medicare uh, Part A. They do not pay a premium for Medicare Part A because you're already paying that Medicare premium now through your payroll deductions. So $1.45 goes towards Medicare Part A, $6.20 goes towards your cash uh, payment from Social Security. Okay, um, Social Security actually relies on the three-legged stool in regards to Social Security and, and what it does for you or what it does for your household. What we do is, although there are four things listed here, Basically, they're looking at when someone is retirement age, they're coming in to file for retirement benefits. 
that they figure you should have at least three sources of income. Those three sources uh, could, of course, include Social Security benefits, uh, your pensions or annuities from your job, and any type of savings or investments like your 401k and things like that. If you have any additional, that's an added uh, support for you as, as being able to support yourself as you're getting older and not able to work. But at least that three-legged stool uh, outlook is what Social Security looks at. But we know that there are some circumstances where individuals may not have um, these other forms of income. Everyone's not, you know, not fortunate to actually work the same job uh, their entire life. Uh, but if they are, that's great. Um, but, you know, what happens a lot of times when you move from job to job and you've paid in Social Security taxes, quite often, instead of actually rolling those funds over, we withdraw them. OK, so that there's no additional pension income available to you once you've actually withdrawn those funds and actually, you know, converted those over to cash and things like that. So if you withdraw the funds from from your prior jobs and of course, that's a strike on that pension uh, level of uh, from that three legged stool. So quite often that's why you find individuals as they're, you know, aging uh, 62 and over and receiving retirement benefits quite often. Uh, that's why you see that they have they they are telling you that the only source of income that they have is their social security income is because they do not have an uh, an extra pension or annuity in act to actually rely on. So in regards to retirement benefits, retirement looks at your entire lifetime of earnings, your entire lifetime of earnings. Although you only need ten years paid in in order to qualify for retirement benefits, this is ten years over your entire lifetime. Okay, but when we're doing the computation for your benefits, um, and of course we're looking at your entire lifetime. Okay, so ten years in our ten years gets you in the door. What does it get you in the door to? It depends on what you've worked and paid in with your Social Security taxes. A a credit for this year in 2022 is equal to one thousand five hundred and ten dollars. Okay, so in order to receive the full full four credits this year then you would need to earn at least $6,040. That gives you full, full credits for the year 2022, okay? So um, remember I stated just a second ago that when we're um, looking at your retirement benefits, we're looking at 30, uh, we're looking at your entire lifetime, but we're also looking at 35 of your highest grossing years. Uh, in that time period, there could be some zeros uh, on your earning statement. And I encourage you not, and I, that's part of later on in the presentation, but I do encourage each of you, if you do not already have a My Social Security account set up for yourself, I encourage you to go to uh, our website, socialsecurity.gov, and set up a My Social Security account. Um, this is actually helpful to you as you're, as you're going through and you're actually working and paying in your Social Security tax, so you can see where you are on the math, okay? Look at your numbers. I love to say look at your numbers because your numbers are important. Uh, and so, you know, as we're going through the presentation, I'll, I'll get back into that a little bit more. But please, if you do not have a My Social Security account established for yourself, please go to our website, socialsecurity.gov, and set one up for yourself. And so when, you, when it's time for retirement age, um, again, we're going to look at 35 of your highest grossing years. But what if you have some zero years in there? What if you took some years off? Um, to take care of your, your, your babies, your minor children when they were young and not in school. Well, Social Security has a provision whereby, you know, when we ask the question on a retirement claim, we can uh, uh, delete or, or take away up to five of those zeros for you if uh, they were child rearing years, child rearing years, okay? There, we can take another another five uh, zeros if you had a period of time doing your employment or doing your work history where you were not able to work, uh, maybe experiencing some type of disability. We can we can um, take away at least another five years. It's called a disability free. So make sure that when uh, as you're going towards, even if you're helping someone, helping a parent or a relative uh, apply for retirement benefits. Make sure that you you take notice of those zero years if there are any, and make sure you you know you know why they're there. Okay, and if they have something to do with your child rearing years, uh, and that's male or female child re uh, re rearing years, as well as disability a disability freeze, then of course we can uh, deduct you know or take off at least up to 
10 of those zeros, which means that now we're doing the math based on 25 years as opposed to 35 of your highest grossing years. So that's extremely important. This chart here, we love to have this chart during the presentation because this really kind of gives you a, a good picture as to what uh, or how your Social Security benefits will fluctuate based on when you actually receive the benefit. OK, um, so basically, if you use a 66 as your full retirement age in here, you see that that benefit is at least a thousand is a thousand dollars. OK, of course, these are all ad lib numbers, uh, of course, so, you know, but for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to say a 66 is your full retirement age. OK. Uh, so, but you can come in and file for retirement as early as age 62. Okay, so you see the amount for at age 62 is about $750. That's about 75% of what you be due at your full retirement age. Okay, the later you wait to apply, the more that percentage goes up. So at 63, the percentage is about 80%. At 64 is at 86.6%. And at 65 is about 93.3%. But what happens if you wait to draw with us, uh, wait to receive your benefits after your full retirement age? You can see that based on this chart, your benefit grows approximately 8% per year up to age 70. OK, it does not grow after age 70. So if, if you wanted it to grow and you're approaching age 70, it does you, does you no good to let it sit there. Come and get your money. OK, come and get it. Go ahead and file that application. Come and get your money. OK, so it grows about 8% per year for every year up to age 70. OK. This chart here kind of gives you a little bit of percentage of the uh, 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 of overview of the deduction percentages. Again, you can come in as early as a 62, but if you come at 62, you're going to receive a reduction. That reduction um, for, for individuals in room born after 1960. Our full retirement age is 67, but again, we can come in as early as age 62. If we come in at age 62, that reduction that we receive is about 30% of what be what we'd be due at age 67, of course. And it not only affects the amount that we receive as the worker, it also affects the amount that your spouse can receive as well if they are filing on your record. So a spouse uh, taking benefits at age 62 will receive a at least a 35% reduction in the amount that they would actually be able to receive at their full retirement age. Remember, full retirement age, that's that's the that's the 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 key number to keep in mind based on what your year of birth is that determines your full retirement age. Again, individuals born after 1960, your full retirement age is 67. OK. So when you come in to file for retirement benefits, we can pay you the worker. We can also pay your spouse, OK? So we can pay your spouse a maximum benefit of up to 50% of what your benefit is, is OK? Uh, that 50% is payable to them at their full retirement age. But if they come in early at age 62, remember the last chart just showed you they'd be due about 35, is a 35% reduction of that. So think about, you know, it's even more reduced from that, OK? Um, so if your spouse, uh, if basically if you're applying for benefits on, on your record and you're legally married to someone, what we're going to do when you're when we're coming in, uh, when you're coming in to ask uh, about your Social Security amount and you tell us that you're married, we're going to see how much you do on your own record and how much you do on your spouse's record. We're going to pay you on the money on the one that's going to give you the most money. We will not financially disadvantage you. We will give you your numbers. You tell us yay or nay, you're ready for us to actually pay you the benefits. OK. We can also pay divorce spouses. So if you were previously married for at least 10 years, you can file on your former spouse's record as well as they can file on yours. OK, so when you come in to file or when you contact Social Security, to file for uh, your benefits, we ask you all types of probing questions, and that's for a reason. We ask you about your former spouses or your former marriages because all of those things come, come into play as we're trying to determine which benefit is going to give you the most money. So again, if you're married at least 10 years, you're not legally married when you contact Social Security, and you're at least 62 years old, and your former spouse is at least 62 years old, you can file for benefits on your record as well as on your former spouse's record. OK, now is there a limit at, as to how many spouses you can file on? No, there is not. OK, so if you were married at least two or three times to uh, to a spouse and you were married at least 10 years to each of their spouses. When you file your claim for retirement, 
again, we're going to go through all of their records in order to determine which one is going to pay you the most. Now, here's the kicker with that. If what you would get on your own record is more than what you get on your spouse's record, then we're not going to pay you on your spouse's record. Again, we will not financially disadvantage you. We will pay you on the record. It's going to give you the most money. OK, but if you do more money, say you do more money, say you you haven't really worked a whole lot, but uh, you have a couple of ex spouses or what a former spouses or whatever, and you want to file on it, it's, it's financially advantageous for you to file on spouse number three. OK, spouse number three. All your all of your spouses, one, two and three, they're all living. Everyone is at least 62 and you decide uh, we you look at the record and we determine that, hey, the benefit that you would get on spouse number three pays you more money right now. OK, so we hit the button and we pay you on spouse number three. OK, what if a couple of years down the line spouse number one passes? You've already given us the information in regards to your former marriage to that person. Once a date of death shows up on that first spouse's record, if that benefit is payable, is that's payable on the first spouse's record, the deceased spouse's record is higher than what you do on spouse number three, your benefit will automatically transfer over to the first spouse. OK, remember that in uh, while everyone is living, Social Security pays 100 percent, pays 50 percent while you're living 100 percent in debt. OK. 50% while everyone's living, if someone passes away, that benefit changes to 100%. The thing about receiving survivor benefits, remember retirement starts at age 62. If you're trying to file for widow or widower benefits, survivor benefits, you can come in as early as age 60, but the reduction factor is even more so. Remember we said it was about 70, um, you know, 75% of what you would receive at age 62. If you come in at age 60, the amount that you will receive is about 71.5% uh, of that benefit. But you can come as early as age 60 to file for survivor or widow or widower uh, benefits on for your former spouse's record. OK, so although um, it's so. I'm so have, sorry I, to interrupt. Is, is this sorry. your screen that you're sharing? I just want to make sure I see someone else's screen here. Well, yeah, hold on. It should be. No, that's not me. OK, everybody okay. else, if you can turn your cameras off, we appreciate it. All right, if we can see if we can pull your screen back up. OK, Thank hold you. on. Thank you for, for stopping me. I didn't realize it wasn't showing the right thing. I had mine on the full screen, so it was <laughs> it was going. I'm sorry, guys. Thank you for no, stopping it was, me. It was showing the right screen. It just switched over a little while ago. Oh, OK. okay. It, it, it just switched over. Thank you, y'all. Can we see that survivor eligibility factors? Yes. Mm -hmm. OK, excellent. All right, thank you. Uh, and so in regards to um, Social Security benefits as well uh, with survivors, we not only can we pay you as a survivor, but we can pay your children. OK, so we can pay your children if they're still in high school or up to age 18 and still in high school. If they are still in high school, uh, we can pay them up to 19 in two months. That is if they're in regular high school, not pursuing a GED or anything like that. This is regular high school, 19 and two months. If your child uh, has not finished high school after 19 and two months, then those benefits will stop for them. We do know and we do not pay college students as well. OK, if you have a disabled child, a disabled child who has received a disability decision prior to age 22, we can pay your disabled child uh, benefits off of your off of your record. OK, as well as, you know, we again, we cannot forget that we can pay widows, widowers and divorced widow and widower benefits. OK, so we can pay your children. We can pay your former spouses uh, and your current spouse. OK. So with the again, the auxiliary benefits for children, a child must have a, a parent that is disabled or retired in order to receive benefits off of the Social Security record or the parent. Uh, the child must have a parent who has passed away. Um, and wor has worked and paid in their Social Security taxes. Again, in order for a child to receive benefits off of your Social Security record, the child must be unmarried, younger than age 18, or or 19 and two months if they're still in high school, or they're basically, uh, uh, or they are disabled where a decision was made for them prior to age 22. If you are a grandparent taking care of your grandchildren, 
when you come in to file for retirement benefits and you are the one providing care for your grandchildren, your grandchildren could potentially be eligible for benefits on your record as well. OK, um, basically, you have to prove that you're the ones providing su support for the children and things of that nature. Some different uh, different uh, guidelines in regards to that. But we want you to know because this is more prevalent than not that grandparents caring for their grandchildren can add their children to the record in order to receive a portion of their Social Security benefits. The the difference in that is this. If you're a grandparent currently receiving your benefits and you get custody of your grandchild after your benefits have already started, then you would need to legally adopt your grandchild in order for that grandchild to receive benefits on your record. OK, but grandparents can uh, receive a benefit for their grandchildren. It just depends on the different uh, parameters that are set for you in regards to that. OK, so. When you come into Social Security, you came in at age 62, 63, even 64 or 65, um, and you, you're you getting your benefit from Social Security, but you decide, hey, I want to get a little part-time job, um, you know, just to add a little bit extra income uh, to, you know, to my household, you know, things like that. You can still work while receiving your retirement benefits. And I just want, I want to explain to you how working when you're retired affects your benefits, okay? Again, if you're under your full retirement age, that means 62, 63, 64, 65, even, even 66 sometimes, depending on, you know, depending on what your, what your full retirement age. Again, mine is 67. So if I come in at any time prior to age 67 and file for retirement and I decide to go back to work, then I must limit the amount of earnings that I, that I earn on my job. OK, so the amount that I can earn for the year in 2022 is nineteen thousand five hundred and sixty dollars. That's an average of about sixteen thirty per month. One thousand six hundred thirty dollars per month. If I go over that nineteen thousand five sixty, I am overpaid my Social Security benefits. So what happens if I earn twenty uh, one thousand? See, I go over uh, two thousand dollars. Then basically you're overpaid one dollar for every two dollar that you go over. That may be equivalent to one check, depending on what it, you know, depending on the amount of your Social Security benefits. So how that works is we send you 11, we hold one. Right? You have to be careful of your benefits. If you're saying I'm retired, then you have to limit your earnings. OK, in regards to someone who's reaching their full retirement age, if you are in the year where you reach your full retirement age, you see in that the second little little set of boxes there that that amount is way higher than that 19,560. If you are in the year where you reach your full retirement age, you can earn more money. So in 2022, that amount is established as fifty one thousand nine hundred and sixty dollars for the year. OK, which is about a, a little over four thousand dollars a month. Let me tell you how this works. and Maybe I can try to um, clear this up for you a little bit. My birthday is in August, OK? And so for the year that I reach a 67, I could possibly come into Social Security in January, file my retirement claim. Remember, I, I, can, I can earn more money that year, right? So from August through July, as long as I don't exceed $51,960, I can work on my job. I can get my retirement pension from Social Security and everything moves along. We're good. OK, what happens after August? Remember, August is my full retirement age. August is the month that I reach age 67. After August, we don't care, meaning Social Security doesn't care. We don't care how much you earn after you reach your full retirement age. There is no earnings limit and we do not reduce your Social Security benefit based on the amount of your earnings after you have actually attained your full retirement age. OK, so the year that you reach, uh, you reach your full retirement age, whatever age that is, you can earn more money. You just have to be mindful of, you know, how much you're actually earning. When is your date of birth? Do you think you'll exceed this amount uh, prior to? So from January through July, I can earn up to fifty one thousand. What if my Social Security checks is fifteen hundred two thousand dollars? Then that's an extra fifteen hundred two thousand that I can have coming into the household in addition to my earnings. OK, again, after that, we don't care how much your earnings are. Um, we will not reduce your Social Security benefit based on that. OK, here's another example. Based on um, your benefits and, and working while you're actually retired. 
Okay, say your social security benefits, and these are modest amounts. Okay, so say your social security benefit is about seven hundred dollars amount, uh, seven hundred dollars a month, and you get a job, a little part time job, and you earn nineteen thousand five hundred sixty dollars or less. Then seven hundred times twelve equals eight thousand four hundred dollars for the year. Your benefit will not be reduced. We we'll pay you the maximum amount. We're good, right? But what if you earn that twenty thousand? Say say your benefit is seven hundred a month, but you earn twenty thousand, then your benefit is slightly reduced. Okay, that's about seven thousand eight hundred eighty dollars. And what if you earn twenty three thousand? Of course, it's reduced even more than that. The more you go over, the more your benefit is reduced. It is very easy to get over payments with Social Security. The easiest way is to go to work and not tell us. Okay, you have to tell us that you're working so that we can adjust your benefits accordingly. Okay, the things that we count is earnings or basically your gross pay for employment or your self or your net earnings from self employment. We do not count any other type of pensions or annuities, investment income, dividends, capital gains, any type of other income that is unearned. We don't count that towards the amount of your Social Security benefit or establishing how much your Social Security benefit should be. Okay, but all things in regards to Social Security, some of your Social Security benefits could possibly be taxed. Okay, so if you're receiving Social Security benefits, receiving Social Security retirement benefits, but you're working a job. If uh, some of those benefits, you know, some of your benefits could possibly be taxed. So if you are a single person and you follow your federal income tax return and your earnings are between twenty five and thirty four thousand for the year, then up to 50 percent of your Social Security benefits could be taxable. OK, if you been if your monthly earnings are over thirty four thousand as a retired person, then up to eighty five percent of your Social Security benefits could be taxable. Um, the same is also true for uh, an individual filing a joint tax return and receiving retirement benefits. On the joint tax return, if the household benefits, household income is between thirty two thousand forty four thousand in earned wages, then up to 50 percent of those benefits of your Social Security benefits could be taxable. And again, uh, Earned wages over 44,000, up to 85% of those benefits could be taxable. It's extremely important to know um, uh, when you're actually ready for retirement uh, to know that you're, that's something that you're actually ready to do, okay? Uh, because if you decide to go back to work, you don't tell us. Easy, quick overpayment, you don't want that, okay? Let's talk uh, uh, just a little bit about another provision in regards to uh, Social Security. It's called windfall elimination provision. Uh, we we refer to it as WEP, okay? So with WEP, um, WEP has to do with you working for a company or working for a business whereby you did not pay Social Security taxes, okay? So who's who's uh, affected by WEP? So a lot of times it's your um, your local government, say your police officers, your firefighters. Uh, even your teachers uh, who receive teacher retirement, they pay into teacher retirement system. They don't pay into Social Security. They pay Medicare taxes, but they don't pay Social Security taxes. OK, your firefighters, your 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 police officers, they pay into uh, the private the police re policeman's retirement pension or the firefighter retirement pension. They don't normally pay Social Security taxes. So those individuals are affected by WIP, which means that when they come into Social Security and because they were not faithful to us here at Social Security, we reduce their benefit just a little bit. You know, we reduce their benefit based on the year, based on the fact that they weren't paying in Social Security taxes. This kind of can get into a little bit of, of, of a complicated area there, so I won't even try to explain how WEP affects your eligibility, but you can kind of see for someone who's working and paying in Social Security taxes, the columns on the left um, means that we are going to, that's the that's the, that's the uh, computation or, or, the, or the figures that we use for people who are not affected by WEP. If you are affected by WEP, then you see that 90% changes to 40%. It's a huge difference, okay? And so uh, keep in mind as well that the average reduction for someone who's been WEP, that's what we like to call it WEP, if you are subjected to WEP, is about $280 a month, but the maximum reduction uh, for WEP is about 512, is $512 a month, which means that say you come to Social Security, Say your benefit from Social Security uh, is fifteen hundred dollars, okay? But you're subjected to WEP, so we're gonna hold five five twelve of that and send you the rest. So you'll get probably right at a thousand dollars, depending on the amount of your benefit. So, yes, it, it's a deduction, but you know it depends on what it is that you worked and paid in, and the number of years that you worked for the other company, as well as you know 
the number of years that you worked and paid in social security taxes. You have some individuals who who may be subjected to WEP, but they're also working private sector jobs at the same time. Those those will you know those calculations are going to be different if they if they work them consecutively, then they may not be wept at all. Okay, so it just depends. But the maximum wept uh, reduction is five hundred and twelve dollars per month. Okay, so the other thing that could possibly affect you is government pension offset. We call it GPO. Okay, GPO is a type of uh, benefit reduction whereby uh, you're applying on a spouse's record. OK, uh, and because you're receiving that pension where you're not well, you didn't work and pay in the Social Security taxes, but you're applying on your spouse's record or you even if you're applying on your own or whatever, uh, where we take uh, we go by uh, we use two thirds of your pension in order to determine your eligibility for Social Security benefits. It kind of gives you a little bit of a little bit of a breakdown here. Say you're getting a twelve hundred dollar non covered pension. We take two thirds of that, which is about eight hundred dollars. Say your pension from Social Security. Uh, your spouse's benefits, your widow's benefits is about seven hundred and fifty dollars. OK, so because your your pension that you're receiving from your job is more than what we can pay from Social Security. Quite often you will not be eligible for the benefit. OK, but um, if you're if you're re if your widow's benefits are fifteen hundred a month. OK, and your pension, the two thirds of your pension is still the 800 then we could possibly pay you 700 but it just depends on the amount that you're actually eligible for those are all case by case basis i wanted to make sure i i, I threw that out there we're gonna bump it a little bit and keep it moving because <laughs> gpo and web can be a little bit uh complicated in regards to uh the calculations for pensions and things like that okay any questions so far any questions in the room so far No questions. We do have Sonia raised her hand. OK, Miss Sonia, what you got? I was trying to ask if we were going to get uh, copies of this after the training because it's kind of you most certainly I are. I'm go I am going to send uh, a PDF copy of this. Um, these are not secrets. Everything that we're talking about today is public knowledge, so you will receive a PDF copy of uh, these slides at the conclusion of the training. Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay. And then we have um, Abney, if I'm saying your name right. Um, the question, if you start taking benefits prior to your full retirement age, is the restriction on earnings lifted after I reach full retirement age or is it always in place? Correct. Remember, after you reach your full retirement age, we don't care what you earn. IRS cares, but we do not. So we do not reduce your Social Security benefit once you have reached or, or attained your full retirement age. OK, you can earn. You can be a millionaire. We don't care. Again, IRS cares, but we don't. So, you know, you're not subjected to that limit. OK, great question. Anything else? Sylvia, she um, I think she just wants to do a comment. I'm not sure you can come off and mute if it's more. Hello, I worked most of my life with Brownsville ISD. Um, mm -hmm. I received no SS deductions. I just started working and using my Social Security number. Is it? Um, I'm not sure if you're going to cover anything for people just start using their Social Security number, but been working. Well, um, basically, that's the web. That's the web part. That's what she's asking about. So if you have okay. some additional questions in regards to web, you can email me at, at the conclusion uh, of the presentation and we, we can try to look at what it is or what's going on with you. But basically, that is correct. If you're working for a school district, you're not paying Social Security taxes. OK, and then um, the last question I see, let someone else see some questions. Alda? Um, I was a stay at home mom for most of my life. I'm now divorced. I heard that I can file for SS under my ex husband's income as long as I do not remarry. That is can correct. she get re okay? Yeah. All right, under your, wonderful under your, uh, record. Remember, you have to be at least 62, and so does uh, your spouse. 
Okay, as long as both of you are at least 62 years years old, you can contact us and file for benefits. We'll look at your own earnings information as well as your spouses and we'll pay you on the one that's going to give you the most money. So for individuals who, you know, who were not able to work because you, you know, you were a home a home a homemaker things like that. Then of course that's why that benefit is put in place for you in order to protect you and make sure that you have some type of uh, benefit for yourself. So yes, you have a right to file on your spouse's record. Wash Andrea, there's also someone by the name of Christopher Doyle who has their hand up as well. Okay, I'm sorry, Christopher, go ahead on. Hey, good morning. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. I was just wondering if there were any exceptions to the 10 year rule for marriage if the person filing on an ex spouse's uh, benefits was a victim of uh, domestic abuse. As far as I know, there is no exception. Okay. And also, if a um, if someone, is, oh, I think that's the next thing you were going to go over. So, but uh, just if someone was filing, trying to get retirement on files for retirement, and they um, they're already on SSI, is that would that affect? Uh, how much they receive in SSI. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, let's 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 discuss that because that's a great question. SSI is a because it's a needs based program. One of the provisions of SSI state that you must file for and receive any other type of benefit that you are eligible for. So if you have an individual who um, who's between the ages of 18 and 64 receiving SSI because they have not worked and paid in enough Social Security taxes, once they attain a 62 and our system does a, a, a records review in order to determine that this person maybe work uh, some years at least over a combination of, of 10 years and maybe eligible for Social Security retirement, they must file for that benefit, even if that benefit makes them ineligible for SSI. Remember, SSI is a last resort type program. And so again, you must file for and receive any other benefit. You do not have a choice to say, well, I don't want that. Uh, I want to keep my SSI. That's not the provision of the program. You must file for and get it. Um, you know, because we have individuals who have said, well, I don't want that benefit. I want the SSI. Then what happens is if you don't file for the other benefit, even if it's not so security, if it's a pension with another company or, you know, some other type of, of, of recognition where they have, they can recognize that you're due a pension from somewhere else. If you choose not to get that pension, then they're going to stop your SSI because you didn't file for it. Okay. So that it's not an option not to receive it. So you you know you have to file for that benefit. And and the last hand I see up is Sylvia. Um, I had a question regarding uh, teachers. Some teachers work in school districts where they pay Social Security and TRS. Is mm -hmm. that is that do they they do they get to collect not just their TRS retirement, and do they get to collect Social Security as well? Yes, if you're paying both, then yes. You have a lot of the universities who have moved towards uh, their employees paying Social Security taxes in, in addition to <laughs> retirement into the university retirement system. And so, yes, you're not subjected to well, depending okay. on the number of years that you actually paid. So, yes. All right, well, thank you very much. No problem. All right. Um, we're going to continue to move on. Y'all can keep posting questions in the chat. We're going to see if we missed any. And um, it's a lot of service providers on here. And y'all probably see how this is tying into the clients that you work with. But we're going to wrap it all up in a pretty bow at the end. OK, all right, let's keep going. OK, so we're going to talk about disability just a little bit. I know you guys are already familiar with disability, so we're not going to beat the dead horse. OK, so uh, but I want to tell you about disability just because um, you as the worker or as a worker, uh, yes, you are you're in the business where you assist folks. But what happens if a tragic event happens and we have to sit on the other side of the desk? and we have to file a claim for ourselves, okay? So you need to know how disability affects you. Remember Social Security uh, disability, the definition of it, whether it's disability or SSI, the definition of it is you have to have a, a medical condition that's either mental or physical that lasts at least 12 months or longer, 
prevents you from working or could ultimately result in your death. OK, and so um, that definition applies to someone who has worked and paid in Social Security taxes, as well as individuals who are not able to work and pay in Social Security taxes. OK, basically, when you're that remember that that 6.2% that's this benefit as well okay keep in mind that disability pays you 100 percent no matter when you get it okay remember retirements you can get reduced retirement benefits because you're coming in early at age 62 but if you are disabled it pays you 100 percent so um you're going to probably hear me refer back to um that your your uh your your earning statement your my social security account because if you look at your earnings statement, you're going to see some different numbers on there. You're going to see some numbers on there for reduced retirement, full retirement, delayed retirement. That's what we just discussed, OK? But also you're going to see some numbers on there in regards to disability. So if, if something happens and you have to file for disability for yourself, you'll see that the amount that's listed on the disability is just about equivalent to the amount that's listed for full retirement. It pays 100% no matter when you file for it. So it's 100% based on what you work and paid in before you actually draw that benefit. OK, so remember as well with disability. You know, when, once once DDS determination has has determined that, you know, you file for disability, you know, they're looking at are you working? Is your medical condition uh, condition severe? Um, does it meet the listing? for severe impairment enough to the point where they can approve this disability claim. Can you do the work you did before or can you do any other type of work? When they're looking at all of that, and of course this, this sounds familiar to you because this is what you're doing for your clients, but keep in mind that if something happens and you need to file for disability, they're going to be asking these same questions of you. You know, they're looking at what are you doing now? What were you doing prior to uh, you became you becoming disabled? What is your education level? What have you been trained in? What are kind of skills and abilities that you have? Do you have any other type of certifications? Anything like that? All of those things are important when it comes to in order to determine what's going on with uh, with you and us determining making a determination as far as your personal social security disability or, or some for your family members, you know, that type of thing. Remember uh, as well, if you're not familiar with the Social Security Blue Book, um, you can look this up on our public website, on socialsecurity.gov website. The Blue Book tells the physicians or tells the health professionals what it is that we're looking for. What is DDS looking for in order to determine eligibility for disability? OK, what is it that they're looking for? What you know, if the person has diabetes, they're looking at the severity of the diabetes. You have plenty of people who are diabetic who go to work every day. OK, but is your diabetes diagnosis uh, severe enough where it keeps you from working? Of course, any other type of illness or injury that you may have, that blue book will kind of give you some enlightenment as to um, what they're actually looking for. Uh, compassion allowances. I'm sure that you are familiar with this term as well. Uh, but our our Cal benefits, uh, our Cal uh, allowances are those where basically, based on what it is that you've put on the medical records or in your medical records, uh, can we get a quick decision for you? Okay. Some of the Cal decisions come back within within as little as three to five days. Some of them take a couple of weeks. It just depends. Okay. But that is a software program. Uh, in regards to Social Security. So once you actually, you know, if you're filing online or if you're if you're doing your forms on paper, once the, the representatives from Social Security actually put this information in and, and send it to DDS uh, in regards to the disability claim, the system does a check of the diagnoses and, and, and allegations and things like that. And the system determines whether or not this particular case meets the, uh, the requirements for CAL. OK, uh, in regards to our veterans and the wounded warriors, remember, if you are a veteran or a wounded warrior um, with a, you have to submit a letter to Social Security stating that you're 100 percent permanent and total uh, disability rating. Now, what that does is it expedites your claim, but it does not guarantee approval. OK, but it will expedite your claim, just like we expedite the, the SOAR claims. If you have some uh, an individual who's a wounded warrior, 100 um, percent permanent and total dis, uh, disability rating, then of course those claims will be expedited. OK. If you are a younger worker and you are you find yourself disabled, if you're, you're younger than age 31, then you can uh, be eligible for a disability with less years paid in in Social Security taxes. 
I say this because we have our younger generation who's who's taking a little bit longer to get into the workforce. Everybody's not going to work at 15, 16, 17, like back in the day, you're not being forced to do so. Uh, and so, but if you have a younger worker who uh, say your person is age 24 and something happens and they become disabled, if they have worked and paid in social security taxes for at least a year and a half, then they would potentially be eligible for a disability based on that year and a half of earnings. Uh, an individual who's age 29, all they need is four years paid in. OK, here's another thing I want to make sure that I and I, and I of course, I, I didn't mention it earlier, but. If you have an individual uh, who's filing for disability, remember, so Social Security retirement is based on your entire lifetime of earnings, but you can't get it until age 62. But for disability, you can sometimes lose your eligibility for benefits if you haven't worked and paid in social, social security taxes within five out of the last 10 years prior to you becoming disabled. So that's why you may have individuals who may have worked really good before. And so now something has happened, they've stopped working. And now it's been seven years since they last worked and paid in social security taxes. If, if it's seven years later and you're just now coming to social security to file for benefits, then you don't meet the five out of the last 10 year parameter, that, that five, five out of the last 10 year requirement. So that's why you have adults who are receiving just SSI because they didn't meet that, you know, that criteria because although your eligibility for retirement stays in place, you can lose your eligibility for disability if you haven't paid in Social Security taxes within five out of the last 10 years prior to becoming disabled. Just like on the retirement side where your children can receive benefits off of your record, if you are disabled and receiving Social Security disability insurance, your child can receive benefit off of your record as well. Um, your disabled children, as well as your spouse can receive benefits. Your spouse can receive benefit uh, if they uh, have reduced income uh, and they uh, or the income is below a certain amount or they're not working and they're taking care of your minor child who's under the age of 16. OK, so we can still pay your children uh, on your record, even if you are disabled, we can pay your children as well. OK. In regards to Medicare, OK, so the different parts of Medicare, uh, or we normally you would say A, B, C, and D, but now they want to refer to Part C as Medicare Advantage. Okay, so your Medicare Part A, remember that's that 1.45 percent. That's Part A. Okay, Medicare Part B has a premium involved with it. Uh, you do not pay that out of your Social Security taxes. That is uh, that has a monthly premium uh, for this year of 170 dollars and 10 cent. Uh, and then you have your Medicare Part D, which also has a, a premium involved with that as well. Your Medicare premiums, your premiums for Medicare C and D uh, are based on the plan that you actually choose. And so here's the deal. When you come to Social Security in order to file for Medicare coverage, we can only enroll you in Medicare Part A and B. Remember A and B, there's no there's no premium for that. So we'll just, you know, you'll get that coverage. Medicare Part A only pays for hospital, which means it pays for you to go and lay in the hospital bed. OK? You need Part B or you need to be covered by group health insurance. OK, um, so if you if not, if you don't have private health insurance uh, and you, you know, you can elect to have Medicare Part B again, that premium is one hundred seventy dollars and ten cent. Um, you can we can sign you up for that as Social Security Medicare Part C and D. We don't sign you up for those. You have to contact a Medicare representative in order to sign up for those things. Any questions or concerns that you have in regards to Medicare? Medicare.gov. OK, we can't answer any questions in regards to when well, Medicare didn't cover this and Medicare didn't cover that. We are not Medicare. What we do is we we provide a service to Medicare in your Medicare premiums out of your monthly check, out of your monthly Social Security check. But we do not have any say so, no jurisdiction over what they do and do not cover. OK, and again, we can't enroll you into the Medicare Part C or D coverages, uh, those plans at all as well. OK, so in regards to Medicare, of course, um, if you have an individual who's uh, approaching age 65, then they can apply for Medicare A and B through Social Security. You have a seven month window in order to apply for that, but you can apply for those benefits three months up to three months prior to your 65th birthday. OK, if you have an individual who is disabled and receiving Social Security disability, then after two years, after 24 months of receiving that Social Security, they will become eligible for Medicare as well. 
in addition to that, you have a couple other uh, factors or parameters for individuals receiving Medicare if a person has been diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease, which is ALS, uh, kidney failure, we refer to as ESRD, or if the person is a, a victim of environmental health hazard uh, exposure. There are three enrollment periods for Social Security, um, for Medicare enrollment. So again, initial enrollment uh, occur is a seven month window that occurs three months prior to the month of and three months after your 65th birthday. Seven month window, three months prior to the month of and three months after your 65th birthday, okay? General enrollment occurs every year, January, February, March of each year. If you enroll during the general enrollment, then your, your Medicare coverage begins in July. General enrollment, you apply in January, February, March, your coverage begins in July. Special enrollment period. If you're over the age of 65 and you've been working and you've been covered by group health insurance, you do not have to have Medicare Part B. Remember, you do not have to have Medicare Part B. If, as long as you're working or are covered by group health insurance, either from your work or your spouse's work. Okay, if that coverage stops, then you have an eight month window to contact Social Security to file for Medicare Part B benefits under a special enrollment period. Okay, when you contact us, you'll need to provide some information to us that shows that from the time that you turn 65 up, say you, uh, you apply at 67 or 68 for Medicare Part B because you have decided to retire from your job. So you would need to provide documentation from your employer that stated from the age of 65 up until the day that you, you last worked that you were covered under group health insurance from your job, okay? If you are unable to provide that letter from your employer or we are, we are unable to verify that and we have no other way to prove um, that you were covered by the insurance, then Medicare charges a penalty for every 12 months that you are eligible to apply for Medicare Part B but you did not. That Medicare penalty is enforced by Medicare. It is 10% per year and uh, it's not waivable. Okay, that is a Medicare penalty. So you have individuals who um, say they were eligible at 65 and we started deducting from their check and they determined I can't afford for you to deduct this money from my check. So I'm canceling my Medicare Part B coverage. Okay, but you come back at 70 right you come back at 70 you're experiencing some health problems you need to go to the doctor you don't have any other health insurance you want to enroll in medicare medicare is going to charge you the 10 percent penalty per year so you coming in at 70 that's a 50 50 percent penalty on top of the 170 that that's actually due okay so keep in mind be mindful of of those penalties that are in place because again they are not waivable medicare will not reduce those penalties for you okay and so if you're applying late or you're applying, um, you know, out of that time period, then you're going to be subjected to that penalty. OK. Um, in regards to Medicare Part A, uh, if you don't have enough quarters of coverage paid in and you can pay, you can apply for uninsured Medicare benefits. These these cases are 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 actually more more prevalent than than you would think for individuals. Um, who are eligible for or want to apply for Medicare, but if you have a person who has not worked and paid enough Social Security taxes to the point where they are insured uh, for Medicare Part A coverage, you can pay that premium out of, pro out of pocket. Now, it's pretty pricey. You see it right there. It's $499 uh, a month um, for a person who's uninsured, for a person who has uh, who has worked some but doesn't have enough uh, for basically the 40 quarters, uh, then you could, they could still pay a, a, an increased Medicare Part A premium uh, of about $274 a month. It just depends on how many, you know, how many uh, credits they actually have, okay? Uh, the two, uh, 2022 uh, deductible for Medicare is $1,556. Remember, Medicare Part B uh, covers about 80% of your doctor bills, your doctor expenses. So remember, Medicare Part A pays you to go and lay in the bed. When the nurses and, and doctors are examining you, they're they're taking your blood, they're they're hooking you up with IVs and all this other kind of stuff. That's where the Medicare Part B comes from. Okay. And so if you don't have any other coverage, then Medicare is going to cover about 80% of those. Okay. Uh, remember again, the Medicare premium is $170.10. $170.10. Okay. Now I, I left this slide in here just so you can see 
um, that everyone is not created equal. And so if your income is above a certain amount, then you're going to pay an increased Medicare premium. OK, of course, this does not apply to everyone, but based on what your adjusted gross income is, you may be subjected to pay more than the regular $170 Medicare Part B premium. You know, if this is applied for, uh, you know, if this applies to you for this year for 2022, these amounts are adjusted yearly. They are based on your uh, your federal income tax returns, your adjusted gross income, and it's based on what your income was two years ago. So we use your MAGI from two years ago to determine what your premium is this year. OK, so again, you can see these amounts. I won't get into them because they do not apply to everyone. But for those individuals who are higher earning individuals, uh, just know that they are paying a higher Medicare premium because of it. OK. One other thing that I want to make sure that I, I uh, address with you guys is just as Social Security has a My Social Security account, Medicare has a MyMedicare.gov account. And so if you are assisting a family member, if you know a family member who is entitled to Medicare benefits, make sure that they are they have established or set up a MyMedicare.gov account. With that account, that helps them to keep track of maybe upcoming appointments that they may have, even past appointments that they have had, uh, their doctors for coverages and things like that. This, this is helpful to them, okay? And if they have questions or concerns in regards to the to the, the, their Medicare coverage and, and things like that, having that MyMedicare.gov account is very helpful to them in order to be able to, you know, address whatever issues that they feel like they're addressing. Starting in 2018, if you haven't seen a Medicare card yet, this is what they look like now. Prior to, of course, uh, prior to 2018, your Medicare cards came to you with your social security number on them. Thank God they've changed that. And so now you are assigned um, a distinctive Medicare number on everyone who's actually enrolled in Medicare right now moving forward. That was a huge plan that they went through, a huge, huge deal that they went through in order to get everyone changed over to a Medicare number as opposed to using your social security number. Hopefully that helps with some of the uh, identity theft that might have been going on during that time period because if you lost your Medicare number, then someone had access to uh, your Medicare card and someone had access to your social security number. If they knew any little thing about you, they could possibly, you know, do what folks who are on the other side of the law do and do something to adversely uh, affect you and, and, and you as a person. OK, so your, your new Medicare card comes with a Medicare um, number assigned to you. Again, any questions or concerns that you have, um, they need to be addressed uh, to Medicare.gov. OK. Last thing that we want to discuss uh, today is um, their My Social Security account. So if you have visited um, our public website at any time lately, you'll see you'll probably see something like this image like this. But right under the picture of, of, of the man and the woman there looking at the laptop, you'll see something that says My Social Security again. I encourage you, if you do not have a My Social Security account established, please do so today. As soon as you, you know, you leave from this presentation, set up yourself a My Social Security account. What it does is it vets you from information that only you would know. This means that they're going to ask you questions that's based on the information that's probably on that's that's on your credit report. So it's information that you would know and not someone else would know. OK, this is extremely important. Again, check your numbers. I tell people all the time it's important to check your numbers because say you're on a job and say you earn 63,000 for the year. OK, and say this was 10, 12 years ago, you earned 63,000. But you look at your earning statement and. Your employer put 36,000. That's a huge, a huge difference in what you earned. OK, you can check these numbers now to make sure that your information is in place, make sure it's accurate to the point where you get it corrected now so that when you file for retirement, when you turn 62 or 67 and you don't have to worry about getting corrected. OK, um, what if your employer didn't post any of your earnings for a year that you know you worked? OK, and what if now you're checking your numbers and you see that you see zeros in the middle of your earning statement, but that company has gone out of out of business 
and you don't have your W-2s because you probably do like our internal revenue advises you to do and you throw away your taxes and W-2 information after about three years, right? Everybody's not quirky like me. I keep them all. It doesn't matter how far I've had to go back. I have them all, right? Everyone doesn't do that. And so what if this happened seven years ago and that company is, is out of business? You have zeros posted and you don't have your W-2s to prove that you work for this particular company. There's no way that we can handle So check your numbers, guys. Make sure that you are checking your numbers. Set up a My Social Security account, okay? This is what, if you haven't already gotten one, this is what your earnings statement looks like now, okay? Before, your earnings statement had, had green font. Like, I always say green like money, right? But now it's red, white, and blue more in, in accordance with Social Security's, uh, you know, uh, logos and things like that. So it's red, white, and blue, got some gray in there, but you can see what your earnings are. This is what your earnings statement looks like now, okay? So if you receive it in the mail, it is legit. It's not the one that comes with the green writing anymore, okay? So this is what your earnings statement look like. And if you're between the ages of 49 and 60, you will get an extra little flyer in with your earnings statement that kind of tells you some information in regards to uh, your benefits and things like that. Okay, any questions or concerns? Any questions or, oh, one more thing, let, let me make sure that I, that I address with you, using your My Social Security account. Even if you are not eligible for benefits, you can use your My Social Security account, um, again, to check your numbers, but also if you in, are in need of a Social Security card that does not include a name change, you can use your My Social Security account in order to get a replacement Social Security card. OK, the caveat of that, the, the, the thing of that is as long as the address where you want your car to go. Is the same address that is on your driver's license or your state ID. We can send the card out to you, OK? We can send the card out to you. So even if you're not receiving a benefit, you can you can use your My Social Security account for things such as that. If you have someone who is eligible for Social Security benefits, they can use that account to update their address, their direct deposit, their phone number information, um, to designate a payee for their record. They can get a benefit verification letter and, and all of that. And also they can report their wages as well. So um, your My Social Security account is is valuable too for you. They can also get replacement 1099s as well and replacement Medicare cards using their account. Okay. Any questions or concerns? We do have um Sylvia hand is still up. I'm not sure if it's a new question. Okay. And then in the chat we have, let's see, I think it just switched. Um, if a surviving spouse remarries, do they lose their survivor's benefits? You can remarry after age 60, okay? If you remarry after age 60 and you're a surviving spouse and the amount of, of your check is less than what you'd get on your current spouse, you can choose to continue receiving benefits on your former spouse's record. Thank you. It, it will not financially disadvantage you, so you can continue to receive that benefit if it's higher. Now, if receiving the benefits on your current spouse's record is, is more, then by all means, move to the other one. Okay, and we thank you. We also have a question from um, Joshua. Um, what's the best way for a person with a disability to obtain control over their SSDI income due to their preference when the benefit is currently sent to the person's mother. If you're asking for do they are they eligible for uh, direct pay? If they want direct pay without the use of a representative payee, then we need a doctor's concurrence in order to do so. Rep pay, the, what we want to do as Social Security is we want to pay you your benefit directly, okay? We want to pay you your benefit directly. So, uh, without the use of a payee, but something, you know, things occur when you file for your benefit. It could be that, you know, you were a victim of an accident or some type of event to the point where you need assistance in handling your benefits. And so initially when you apply for disability, you may not be, be eligible or be, be able to take care of your financial responsibilities, okay? Which is why 
uh, DDS uh, or, or the judge may state that, yes, you're approved, but you need a representative payee. A representative payee can be temporary. OK, so what if you were a victim of a stroke uh, and initially you you couldn't walk or you, you couldn't talk or you couldn't communicate the way you needed to. And so a representative payee was appointed for you. But now you're a year and a half, maybe two years later and you have done your rehabilitation and you have recuperated to the point where, yeah, you don't need this assistance anymore. Just bring us a doctor's concurrence in order to do so. OK, we can change it over because we want to pay you. You wouldn't believe the amount of, of reports that we get from people saying that my payee is not paying my bills or my payee is abusing my funds or misusing my funds. So we would like to pay you your benefits directly so we can change it over. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yes, this is being recorded. That was one of the questions. Um, we're going to try to post it on the Austin Echo website. I am going to transfer it to a different department to see if we can do that. Um, they will try to do a transcript. I cannot I cannot promise that. Um, I have asked them um, so we can try to get that done. It looks like I do see another hand up. Let's see. Um, Christopher? Hi there. Um, I have a really fast question. Um, for the individual that wants to have control over their own finances and once they have that form filled out by the doctor, how do they turn that in? What's the fastest way to, to get that over to y'all? Bring it into the field office with your picture ID, with a valid picture ID. Not that our field offices are back open. I know that's an elephant in the room. Our field offices are back open. Uh, they reopen on April 7th. Um, while it is preferred that you have an appointment in order to visit our offices, uh, we are accepting walk-in uh, visitors. OK, uh, keep is keep in mind as well that um, masks are still required in our field offices. We know that everyone else is, is ready to take them off, but we are not uh, here at Social Security. So masks are retired uh, are required when you come into the field office. Uh, we are um, acknowledging uh, social distancing or physical distancing. So um, there may be an instance where someone who's visiting and we are at capacity inside the office where you may have to wait outside before uh, you're allowed into the office. And so uh, you may have to wait outside. Um, and then, of course, you know, be prepared for extended wait time. So pack your patients. We don't know. Um, remember, prior to pre our, our pre pandemic uh, times, a lot of our field offices across the country see four, five, six hundred people a day. OK. But now uh, with everyone, you know, with how we've had to do business for the for the last two years and individuals trying to get in with phone calls and, and appointments and things like that. It's picking back up, guys. And so, again, I say pack your patients. Uh, if you have to go into the office, please do. We will not turn you away. But a, a, an appointment is the preferred way to visit or take care of business with us if you can't do business uh, via your my Social Security account. Thank you. And for um, the SOAR representatives that's here today, that's one of the benefits of SOAR is that we have a SSA liaison there that work just with our claims and we can fax in the information for them to get on it immediately. And so that's a benefit of having SOAR, that, that form can be faxed in. Um, also, I see a question. Um, it says, I work a lot with clients who have created an account, but have forgotten their login information and cannot access it. What can they do to recover their account information? Uh, they can either go into the office and ask for um, a new password to be sent to them, or they can contact our 800 number and they can send them a, a new password request. Login information. What? Wonderful. And um, if you already asked your questions, please lower your hands. And if you want to ask the question directly, you can go ahead on and raise your hand up. Um, another question. Uh, we have a few more. How does it work when your spouse pass away? Is it a lump sum or is it a monthly payment? It's two things. OK, so if your spouse mm -hmm. passes away and they were insured for Social Security, uh, benefits uh, upon their death, then you'll be eligible for a $255 lump sum payment in addition to monthly uh, survivor benefits. Now, those survivor benefits are based on, uh, again, your earnings. If you are working and a 
and working above the allowable limits, then the survivor benefits may not be paid to you, but we can probably pay them to your children if you have some children. Uh, if not, then you can wait uh, a little bit later, uh, maybe until you retire. But yes, you you know, it's a lump sum payment as well as monthly payments moving forward. Wonderful. Thank you. How can I get benefits for my father? He's 76 year old and do not have his social security number. How can I help him? You probably can take him into the office if he's able to go in. There's not a whole lot that we'll be able to do to help him over the phone. We'll probably need to see him. We'll need to see picture ID, ver uh, valid picture ID for him so that we can verify this information uh, before we'll actually disclose any information. It's not a whole lot you can do for him over the phone in regards to that. Thank you. If someone had an overpayment on their SSI outside of Texas, who do they reach out to? It depends on where they're located. Please unmute yourself so you can tell me where they're located. SSI is a is a national program, so an S, an overpayment for someone who's living in Alabama or Louisiana or uh, Alaska would still be, be on their record even if they are in Texas, okay? So it's a national program. And so if you're overpaid due to wages, due to living arrangements, things like that, the overpayment will still be addressed if you're still eligible for the payment. So if you wanted to elaborate on that, that's, you know, that would be great, but we will still be able to take care of the overpayment. Okay, so Daniel, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mrs. Kimberly. No problem. We will still be able to address the overpayment. Okay, and do you want Daniel to say exactly where they're at? Well, or? if he had, you know, uh, he doesn't have to. Uh, I certainly don't want social security numbers or anything like that in in the in the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. But if he wanted to elaborate on that, we could we can discuss it a little further. Uh, but you know, if if I provided him with what he needs, then that's fine. Okay, so if you need more information, Daniel, just come off of um, mute and you can start talking. I'm gonna keep going. What is the quickest way to schedule an appointment? Probably call our 800 number or contact the local field office in order to do so. Uh, a lot of people are contacting us here in public affairs. We don't have access to the appointment calendars for the offices, so we can't schedule appointments for you. Uh, but, you know, if you're able to contact or get through to your to our 800 number or the local field office, that is the quickest way to schedule an appointment. Now, here's another part of that. The offices can only do so many appointments a day, remember? And so I just had a case where the person has an appointment scheduled they had an appointment scheduled for May, but they didn't like that time frame. And I and I'll be very honest with you, they didn't like it to the point where they went to their congressman's office and said, oh, I don't want my appointment to be in May. I want a sooner appointment. Uh, so uh, they can again, they can only do so many per day. Um, you are still protected no matter when your appointment takes place. So if you call today and today is April uh, 20, 27th, and your appointment is May 27. You are protected from April 27 to the to you know in, into the future. So you know, depending on what's going on and depending on the availability of appointments, they do fill up quickly. But yes, you're still protected from the time that you call. Thank you. And, and I if also, you need, if you need to take care of your business sooner than that, then you can take your chances of walking into the office. Thank you. Wonderful. I also put a link to the local field office finder in the chat and I tested it out. Daniel, he replied, he say um, the person is in Texas. Mm -hmm. if, they're, if they're now in Texas and they have contacted their local social security office here in Texas to establish residency, then of course, if we were already collecting the overpayment prior to uh, in whatever state that they were living in, we will continue to do that. We just have to make sure that we update living arrangements so we can make sure that we're paying them correctly. Remember, SSI is, is because it's a the needs based program, SSI eligibility is based on where you're living as well. So if you were living in Arkansas and now you live in Texas, then you won't have uh, access to Arkansas Medicaid living in Texas. So we need to update your living arrangements so we can get you Texas Medicaid. So it just depends. But for the individual who is receiving SSI, make sure that they have contacted the local field office in order to update their living arrangements so we can get the correct address for them. Wonderful. And Holly, do you want to come off a of mute? I see you have a question. Yes, I'm sorry. I got removed from the chat, so I couldn't ask it. Um, oh written but um i was just wondering um how we how we can get access to somebody who does soar um to help with like the disability applications we just haven't been able to we don't know how that process works or if there's 
if you, you know, how, yeah, just how it works. Okay, that's a wonderful question. Um, we have a few people here <clears throat> in the chat that are local leads and um, definitely connecting with one of them. We are um, trying to recruit more people to do SOAR. It's not enough of us out there. It's a limited number. And a lot of the SOAR providers, I can speak for here in Austin, are tied to certain programs. So at their organization, the only way they can do SOAR is if that person is connected to their program. Now, all of that um, might change. We do have three new organizations in Austin that's going to start offering SOAR. They're currently in the hiring process and in the training process. I see one of them here now um, joining us. And so they may have availability that's open since it's not going to be tied to a Pacific program, but we're in the process of working on that. Um, also, let's see what else that we have available. If we have someone that contacts us and we may recommend that they go to a certain organization, depending on what their issue is, and they have to see if they can get in to that Pacific program that they have. If that's not available, we do recommend other options for them, like contact an attorney, um, going to the Social Security office for um, filing for disability the traditional way until we can get the other programs up and running. Anyone else have comments on that? Okay. <laughs> so um, who, who would be the leads for, can you share the lead? I, I can't, I can't see anything from the chat because I was removed. So could you, oh, do you mind I'm sharing sorry. the leads are? Yes, um, I'm the lead for Austin Travis County and Holly, I can send you what what area are you in? Um, I'm with Cap Metro, so we are all over the city. All over? And, okay. Yeah, anywhere our system goes. We have also what we can do is connect you with Sumitra. And Sumitra, she is the um, TA, um, TA Center Liaison for SAMHSA. And we can connect you with Lila. She is the state lead. And they can connect you with the leads throughout Texas. I'll put my uh, email in the chat box if you want to shoot me an email, Holly. Or a private message. And, I can't. And I Holly can't says see she the cannot chat. see the email. But Holly, I have your email address. Do you mind if I um just go ahead on and send it to Sumitra and um Lila? I have it right here, Holly dot wing w-i-n-g-e at capmetro.org is that correct yes and that'd be great if you don't mind doing that thank you okay and i hope i didn't mispronounce your last name okay so i am going to send that to them and so we can connect you okay all right let's see any other questions let's see we do have um angela When you're ready, Angela. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. I have a client. He had he gets SSI and SSDI, and he's but he got a job. He's working part time. Will he eventually lose his benefits, or will he be able to still get his benefits? Like right now, a month from SSI, he gets like twenty four dollars, and that's it. Remember, exercise based on need. So any and all income you get can directly affect uh, what it is that we pay you. Now, remember, exercise again is also based on the fact that he's getting Social Security. So his benefits are already reduced based on the fact that he has other income. Add right. wages on top of that, and it's going to be reduced even more. So he could possibly lose SSI altogether just because he doesn't meet the income requirements of it. He could possibly lose Social Security uh disability if his earnings are consistently above sga amount sga stands for substantial gainful activity so if his earnings are above one thousand three hundred uh ten dollars a month consistently he could possibly lose social security disability in regards to that because he's working above the limits 
uh, what you have to keep in mind when you have someone who is disabled, you've come to us as a disabled person saying, I'm disabled, I have a medical condition, I can't work, okay? Mm -hmm. Now you're feeling a little better and you decide to go back to work or you decide to pick up a little part-time job or something. You can work. You have to report it first and foremost so that we can make adjustments for you. It is very easy to get overpaid with Social Security in regards to disability and retirement, okay? So mm -hmm. if you don't report it, and say your social security check, just take away the SSI, but say someone's social security check is $1,500, $1,800 a month, okay? But you go and get a job and you make $30,000. you are overpaid every dime we paid you from the time that you started working until you ended, okay? Very mm -hmm. quick $20,000 overpayment for that particular person, okay? But had you reported the earnings to us, we can make those adjustments accordingly, okay? But a lot of times people, they get a little bit overzealous. Uh, they go and they get the job. And they're getting $1,500 a month from Social Security, so it's good money, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it sounds good and it looks good until it's not. And so very quickly, you know, even if you don't report it to us, we're going to get the, the IRS matching. And so okay. the next thing that they'll get if they don't report it is a letter from Social Security stating, tell us about your earnings from this particular employer, okay? Social Security's information is third party, which means that the, the employees, the employers are not reporting this information directly to Social Security, right? So any information that we get that 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 interfaces with our system comes from some other source. And so when we get the information, it's not right now information. So again, it may be 15 months later and you started working a year, you know, over a year ago. Okay. We're going to get the information. So the, the problem people find themselves in is that they don't report it or they don't report it timely. They, they figure, oh, well, it's been about three, four months. I guess I ought to tell them. You're all paid those three, four months if you were, if you were above the, the allowable limits, okay? So okay. disability, uh, uh, medical condition, I can't work, but I started working. I need to tell somebody. Another mm -hmm. question. Once, okay. once he start, if he's uh, released from his, his, assignment, uh, his assignment, later on, will he be, would it be hard for him to reapply for benefits no you can always reapply just keep in mind with disability that we're looking at uh years paid in so to see if you still meet insured status for disability okay so it depends on what you work and paid in um but no you can always be apply for the benefits you I just have to, to you know give us updated information in regards to when you work and when you last worked thank you i, I wanted to add um add to that also um, it's a few options that you can look into. We encourage everyone to go to go back to work. And we mm -hmm. know that some of our cl um, clients that we had may work, stop working, work, stop working. And those may be look at, um, looked at as trial work periods. Correct. Um, that can, uh, it's going to work on their behalf. But also, it is some programs out there and some people that you can contact to find out a little bit more information for your clients and just for yourself. One of them is the Smurf program and that's through the Texas Workforce Commission. And they teach you a ton of stuff about trial work periods, how to calculate it yourself, how the client's check is gonna be affected, how much is gonna be affected. If you really wanted to learn that much detail, then you can go through them and sign up for that course. Um, they also have benefit specialists. Um, um, Mrs. Elder, is the benefit specialist at the Social Security office or is that through someone else? The benefit specialist like the uh, area work incentive coordinator? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're at the Social Security office. They can contact um, their local Social Security office, their local field office, and talk to, um, I call them benefit specialists. Um, there's other names out there where they can go every, over everything in detail for that client. We also have that um, the ticket to work. I put their phone number in the, in the chat and they should have some additional information also. Now let's see, um, we have, now Angela, have, have you already gone? Oh, Tarnisha, I'm sorry, I'm speaking to Angela. Tarnisha? But can you give us the number to ticket to work? Yes, I'm going to put that in the chat right now. Oh, I forgot. Holly cannot see the chat, so I will say it and put in the chat. 866 
866-968-7842. And that's, I'm going to say one more time, 866-968-7842. And um, I'm going to include some of those things I mentioned in the chat, so it's going to take me a little while. Tarnisha, would you like to go? Yeah, um, I may have missed this in the presentation. Um, is there a certain, uh, so is the limitation for how much an individual who has social security insurance or social security retirement, is the limitation like a case by case basis for each individual regarding how much they can make from their job? No. You mean the, the amount that we pay them or the amount that they can earn? The amount that they can earn. The amount they can earn is, is a set uh, figure that is updated every year. So if someone is receiving retirement, then that uh, that amount, remember, is $19,560 uh, for 2022. If someone's receiving disability, the amount that, that would start affecting eligibility was someone would probably be looking at that uh, their earnings is $1,310 a month. Those amounts are set. So if you... Mm -hmm. if, so, so basically, the retired or the disabled person knows what the income parameters are before they go to work. Okay, so they have to they have to try to manage their income to keep them under those limits so it does not affect the eligibility. If they are working, if they are, you know, if they've been trained in the field, they've gone to school and they're working to try to get off the disability, then by all means, use the use the provisions of the trial work period and things like that so that you can, you know, you can get off the disability. Um, my father-in-law is one of those persons. Years ago, when my when my husband was not my husband, uh, his his dad was hurt on the job and and went on social security disability. He actually went and changed. He went to trade school and changed his profession. He got another job and in a, in a whole new profession. And so the disability that he was receiving for those years um, helped the household and helped the family for that time period. But he he needed more income. He needed to be able to support his family. And so he changed jobs, changed professions. And so the Social Security disability that he was getting stopped. And so based on that, is there when you need it? Uh, so it's helpful if, if the individuals are working and paying in the Social Security taxes. But when you don't need it anymore, then, of course, make sure you report it to us so that we can stop those benefits and prevent overpayments from occurring. Thank you. Any other questions or concerns you guys have? No. Again, I will send um, a PDF copy of the presentation uh, so that you can have it. Again, nothing that we're saying here is a, is, is a secret. It's all public knowledge. Uh, it's all available for you. Uh, so it's there for you. So we'll send it to you. Got three oh, hands up. Have we answered those questions? And you can you please. Hear? Yes, go ahead on. Go ahead on. Okay, uh, I, I don't know if I probably missed this, but uh, my mom is 67 and she's working um, full time. So, and I know she's always been asking if she could apply for social security. She doesn't have a disability, but can she do that? Yes. If she's 67, that means she's past her full retirement age. We don't care what she earns. Her benefit from social security will not be reduced. So she can apply. That's extra money. Okay, okay. Okay, and yeah, she can apply unless she's trying to, if she's trying to hold off to get to a certain amount, uh, then of course that's that's her choice. But remember, we don't we don't reduce your social security income once you reach your full retirement age. So if she's working and say her retirement, her full retirement is say it's a couple of thousand a month, then she's letting social security, and I, and I hate to say it like that, but basically we're holding it when she could use it for something. Okay, no problem. Thank now, you. It may, it, it may increase her tax liability because remember, IRS cares. We don't. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah. I get it. <laughs> Thank you. But at least she can use that to pay the extra taxes that, that they're going to charge her. Okay, and what's the latest she can apply for retirement because she is not ready to retire? 70. Seven. Okay. Remember, you know, she doesn't have to apply at all if she doesn't want it. But remember, your money doesn't grow after age 70. Oh. Okay, your money doesn't okay. grow. 
Okay. Thank you so much. I'm so glad I'm here. Thank you. Oh, no problem. No problem. But again, if mom, mom needs to look at her numbers and, and, you know, just really make an educated decision for herself in regards to what am I earning on my job? And what can Social Security give me? Again, when you come to, to our offices to apply for this benefit, we are not going to, to, to tell you whether or not yay or nay that you should or should not do it. We're basically okay. acting as your, as your secretary and we're gonna give you the numbers. This is your number at 62. This is your number at 67, your full retirement age. And this is your number at 870. You tell me whether or not to hit the inner key so I can send you your check, uh -huh. okay? But okay. she has, you know, she, if she's 67, it means she's she surpassed her full retirement age. She can, she's due to maximum benefit and we don't care what she earns as far as her security is concerned. So if it's a couple hundred thousand, a couple hundred thousand, wow. Uh, <laughs> if it's a couple thousand dollars, uh, that, that extra money that, that she's not getting, that she could be getting from social security, then, you know, that's her choice to make. But, you know, we'll be happy to hit the inner key and say, send it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. It looks like we have Clarissa, and I think I've seen someone's hand up, and Shaq would be next after Clarissa if you still want to go. And then Angela, I still see your hand up. If you have another question, then you go next. So Clarissa, Shaq, and then Angela. I, I need to take that down. I'll do, I'll do. Okay, hey there. that's okay. Mm -hmm. Hi. Oh, I'm, hi, I'm a social worker with Community Care, um, and I just actually spoke with a patient this morning who is currently a resident, but he's only been a resident for five years. But before that, he did work plenty of time. I believe he had a social security. So I'm just, you know, wanting to get some information for him. I did advise him to call. Um, and so just that those times before, if he was working with a social security, those would still count towards his work credits for. Yes, yeah. Perfect. Yes. Still counts. Uh, Awesome. Thank so you. Once we issue a, a social security number to you, that number is always yours. It almost take the, takes an act of Congress, an arm mm -hmm. and a leg, a, a limb of some kind in order to get you a new social security number. Although that does happen in the, you know, in the event of uh, domestic violence or, or some other type of issues or concerns, uh, uh, drastic uh, identity theft and things like that. Like years ago, we had a case where a 19 year old uh, was in the office and his parents had sold his number, unfortunately. Uh, and, you know, he had earnings from eight to 10 employees a year for the last 15 years. He was 19. He was an extreme victim of identity theft. So we we issued him a new social security number. But those cases, you know, you really have to prove it in, in order to get it. So any earnings that, that, that your client has earned are still available to him and sitting on his social security record. So, yes. Perfect. Thank you. Mm hmm And Shaq, if you want to say anything. And if not, we're going to go to um, Billy, because I believe the, um, the other person lowered their hand. Yes, uh, I asked a question in the chat, but I don't think you guys seen it. But um, what if you was on disability, um, was well enough to work, it did the ticket to work program as well, um, but um, it turns out that um, um, you were able to work, go back to work full time. So um, you cut off disability for that. But if uh, the client got ill again, can he go back on disability? Mm hmm. Yes, they can go back. Depending on the amount of time frame that they have been off, they may have to file a new claim or, or get updated medical information. But yeah, they can go back. Okay. All right. Are we missing any questions someone <clears throat> might have put in the chat and we overlooked? And um, if so, just come off a of mute now. Um, we're just going to take a few more minutes of questions. All right. All right. So um, we just like to say thank you, um, Kimberly Elder, for presenting this to us, to our community throughout Texas. It's um, people from all over Texas on here today. Uh, a lot of local leads also with SOAR 
on here. We appreciate all the informative information that you provided, taking the time to answer each question everyone has. Um, so just thank you so much for that. You're welcome. I, I saw one last question about someone asking uh, for someone to get their social security number while they're in Mexico. OK. Uh, they may want to go to the Department of State and see about getting that number. Other than that, the person will need to present themselves back here in the United States. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, also, um, I just wanted to to close by saying that definitely you can file for um, retirement while you're applying for your disability. I know some people think you cannot. One thing that I noticed when I was over um, supervising the interns that was um, helping with the SOAR, helping people get their social security disability, definitely when we would apply for retirement for those individuals, it was a very quick process. Um, it was literally connecting the individuals that have a phone with the social <clears throat> sorry about that with the social security office and the social security office initiated everything they scheduled the appointments when they was going to call back and this may not be every case scenario but within three phone calls from a for, from applying for retirement the person was receiving a reloadable card in the mail and also that opened up the door to housing um, our clients got housed quickly because they was receiving that retirement benefits, um, even if it was early retirement. Some of the clients will say, well, we cannot wait till we turn age 66 or 67. We might not make it living out here, on, you know, in the woods or under the bridges. And so they was housed also. Um, so it opened up the door to so many opportunities and it was such a quick process that we experienced on our end with our clients and it wasn't that much additional work besides making that additional connection with them to call the social security office also the social security office is open you can call and make an appointment if they prefer going to the social security office you can walk into the social security office um Mrs. Kimberly also talked about the My Social Security account. I know for some of our clients that we work with that's experiencing homelessness, it's hard for them to remember the information to set up that My Social Security account. So there, there are these other options that we're mentioning um, that would be ideal for everyone. Also working in the field so long of SOAR, we see on the applications that ask all the personal information. And this presentation tied in why they asked about your marriages, if you're a widow, and how that can benefit them, how it can benefit your clients, and how possibly they can get additional benefits in those areas. All right. Um, let's see. Did I miss anything? Um, Lila, Samitra, anyone else that has a comment? Did we miss anything? OK, so we would love, um, of course, we, we love providing other benefit options, but we also would love for anyone that's interested in becoming SOAR trained to contact one of us. Our information is in the chat. I'm LaShendra Dwyer. Um, also, you can contact Samitra Pocato and Lila Odornes. Any of us you can contact to find out more information about SOAR. Um, and we appreciate y'all attending. Thank you. All right. Well, that wraps it up. Okay, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all have a great rest yeah. of your day.